What's going on, everyone? Taylor Kyle's here for CLNS Media, coming at you with another episode of Pats Daily, brought to you by our good friends at Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS Media. But more from them later for now. I am joined by my buddy Mark Daniels of Mass Live, who had boots on the ground at the NFL's annual league meetings. Got to chat with Gerard Mayo, Robert Kraft, get some insight into where they feel the state of the Patriots is right now and kind of how they're thinking going forward with the NFL draft. Now, first, before we get into the mailbag, you guys, as always, had some incredible questions, a lot of them relevant to the event. First, how are you doing, Mark? And what were your big takeaways from actually being there in uh, Orlando, Florida? Yeah, I'm doing well. I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say well rested. The, the owners' meetings, it's fun, but you, you're up really early. Like to get to a, I'd say 45, a 7:45 a.m. interview. We were probably around 6 a.m. You want to get there early. You want to get a seat at the table. So I'm, I'm, I'm well. I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be back home. But it was nice and warm in Orlando, unlike here in New England. But I, my, honestly, my, my biggest takeaway is, is sort of remains the same. I, I believe the Patriots are all in with this quarterback draft class. I, I really do. And Although Gerard Mayo made it seem like they're more open to trading down and listening, which that's what they need to say. I, I still feel like that was smoke, Taylor. Honestly, I, I still think, you know, you hear the way Gerard spoke about Drake May. I think that opened up a lot of our eyes, you know, especially you compared to the answer we gave about Jaden Daniels, where he didn't really talk about him. I think the Patriots are all on his man, honestly. And I think they like Drake May. That was my biggest takeaway. I'm like, all right, Drake May's there at three, man. I, I think it's happening. I think they would draft Drake May. Makes a lot of sense. I know we're going to get into like the specific quarterbacks and everything. I kind of read it both ways, though, with May, because one, it's like he has no ceiling, which is like, all right, we know what Ben McAdoo likes in his quarterbacks. That makes a lot of sense. And then when he also mentioned the floor and that we all like have to be on the same page, because he mentioned that later on about how Alonzo Highsmith told him all the bad picks that he feels like he had made in the past were because people weren't on the same page. And I know Tony Pauline, who's done a great job covering these prospects, mentioned not everybody in the building is sold on May, which is completely fair. If you want to be honest about all the things that he brings and all the exciting qualities for Drake May, you also have to acknowledge there's things that need fixing and you're, there's no guarantee that they'll get there. So definitely very interesting comments. You know me. I'm pulling for Drake May. I'm all on board, but we'll see how things actually play out, especially as they actually get to meet with him today after his pro, or before his pro day. I believe they met with him. I'm sure that's going to change a lot of things um, in terms of their internal sentiments. But Let's get into the mailbag. First question, with this new regime in place, how confident are you about the Patriots having a successful draft and getting the correct and needed players? You know, I, I talked to this, um, let's say, NFL source at the Combine, sort of about this. Uh, and this is a guy who works in someone else's front office. He's familiar with the Patriots. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, honestly, it is easier to pick at the top of the draft. It's just easier. You, you have a better, you have a higher chance of getting blue chip prospects. It sh in, in a way, it should be easier for the Patriots. So in a sense, I am confident they're going to leave this draft class with some impact players and some starters. I have heard the Patriots, their goal is to add multiple starters from this 2024 draft class. I, I like I like some of the things they have in place. For example, on offense, you have a lot of guys with experience. You know, Alex Van Pelt, Ben McAdoo, T.C. McCarty are three coaches who have all worked with quarterbacks in the NFL. I, I love it. I, I think they are they're sort of trying to create an environment that can foster a young quarterback. So in that sense, I think they are set up to do that. You know, how confident are we? Got to be honest, though. I've never seen Elliot Wolf pick anyone. You know, we're sort of in the unknown right now. Like, in theory, I think the Patriots are in a great position because all these draft experts tell me, hey, quarterback, tackle, and receiver, that's where that's where it's deep. We know what the Patriots' three top needs are. We know it's quarterback, tackle, and receiver. So hopefully they can, you know, land those players. So I'd say I'm semi-confident because of where they're picking, but a lot of unknown, man. That's a big thing. It is unknown. And if we're being totally honest, it's just, you know, Gerard Mayo talked about what he learned from Mac Jones and how it was really not just the supporting cast like we always talk about, the weapons and the protection, but it was also the fact he had a different offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach every single year that he was with the Patriots. And then you also saw even branching out, especially last year, how there was a lot of dysfunction because there was just kind of a mismatch coaching staff with people that didn't have experience with each other. 
Well, now, as he mentioned, you got Alex Van Pelt. You have T.C. McCartney, who doesn't have a ton of experience coaching quarterbacks, but did play the position and has worked under Van Pelt for multiple years. You get a guy like Scott Peters, who is finally getting, obviously, a chance to lead his own room. But his background with one of the best offensive line coaches of all time, a guy who's even got his own company dedicated to helping guys technique-wise. And then, you know, if you want to go to receiver, Tyquan Underwood and Tyler Hughes. It's not just a lot of these places. It's not just one person kind of running the show. With quarterbacks, it's Van Pelt and McCartney with receivers, Tyler Hughes and Underwood, and then offensive line again, Scott Peters and Robert Kugler. So we need to see what the picks are. But with so, so much talent at these premium spots, it's kind of hard to mess up. As long as you make sure you're using these picks for those spots and you have the guys in place to develop them, I am as confident as you can be with nothing to really base it on um, right. in this organization's ability to support those young guys. So it's going to be interesting. All right, next. What draft trade offer is too good for the Pats to say no to, regardless of how they feel about the top three quarterbacks? Personally, I don't think that's the thing. If they like one of the quarterbacks, it's a no-brainer. Go that direction because I think – even with uh, when they were talking about free agency and how it was kind of, you know, they wanted some guys and they couldn't get them. Robert Kraft mentioned that the quarterback situation might have been a part of that. So, you know, it's great to say, oh, we got a great left tackle. We got a great receiver. But at the end of the day, people are going to sign because it's like, all right, if I go in with this quarterback, I know I have a chance to win. But how do you feel about that? I hate the trade down talk. Honestly, I hate it. I'm, I'm so on board with them drafting at three. And really, I really think they're going to draft a quarterback at three. I don't think we'll trade out. So what trade offer is too good to say no to? If the Vikings come to you with something stupid, here's 11, 23, and Justin Jefferson. Okay, you can talk to me about it. If you want to do 11, 23, and multiple firsts on top of that, it would have to be something so ridiculous the Patriots can't say no to. And the thing with the Vikings, hypothetical deals, I hate trading out of the top 10, Taylor. Now, right now, you could convince me to trade down to six with the Giants and take Malik Neighbors or Joe Alt. Like, if you're the Patriots, I would rather you get the top tackle, Joe Alt, or one of the top receivers, as opposed to going to 11, where those three receivers are gone. Joe Alt's gone. The top four quarterbacks are gone. I hate it. What? Yes, the Patriots have a lot of holes, but you know what they lack? They lack, like, legit talent, like a legit Pro Bowl blue chip prospect. And mm -hmm. if they think that guy is at three and he's a quarterback, you have to take him. Honestly, to the point where even if the Vikings were like, hey, take a 24 and 25 first plus our two here, if you're convinced that Drake May or Jaden Daniels are the guy, you have to say no. You can't kick the quarterback can down the road anymore and have Jacoby Brissett on a one-year deal and Bailey Zappi, who I'm not sure the team even likes. You know, so I I would need something stupid, honestly. I I would need something stupid to get out of that spot. And then even then, I'd still want to come away with like Bo Nix or Michael Penix. So. I totally agree. I think it'd have to be like the two firsts this year, one in 2025, one in 2026, and then probably another day two pick either this season or next. Just something that blows you away and you're like, all right, we can get a lot of talent at this spot. Like you mentioned, at 23, at least I feel like they're still in the range to get like a Penix. I don't know if he's going to you know, be more of a mid to late first round prospect or a second round prospect. But if you do go Roma Dunze or Joe Walt, I think you need to make sure you have a quarterback who does have at least a high floor where you know you can plug them in and they'll have success. Doesn't have the ceiling as other guys like that, but at least if you are going to make that trade, I think you have to get some kind of quarterback who you feel confident in more so than like maybe I like Spencer Rattler, but I also understand that he's got his very real limitations. So yeah, if you like a guy, you got to stay put. There's even with all those first round picks, I, if you get like a Drake May and he turns into somebody who's a top-10 quarterback, I don't think you're really going to care about how many future firsts you gave up. No, then you're set, honestly. You're set. You can build the team around him. Exactly. And he raises all the floor. So if your receiver position isn't great, we've seen what he can do when he has half an offensive line. Like, he can still get stuff done. So, you know, uh, quarterback raises all ships, as they like to say. All right. What's the bare minimum you take to move out of number three if you're 50-50 on the quarterbacks who are left? Bare minimum – would have to be, I, I think, three first round picks. So you're talking bare, like, like hypothetically, like I think the Patriots like Drake May. And I'll be honest, I've talked to people in the building who've told me they've preferred Drake May over Jaden Daniels. I also talked to someone in the building who told me they preferred Jaden Daniels over Drake May. So the opinions are split over there from what I understand. So bare minimum, say like hypothetically though, Drake May's their guy. He goes at two to the commanders and they're really unsure. Bare minimum would have, still would have to be three first round picks for me. Yeah. Like three, like that, that's what it is. You're a team that needs a quarterback. You're in position to get one. If you're sort of iffy about it, I, I'd say, I'd say three first round picks. And we're talking bare minimum. And as I just stated the question before, if I was really to move out of there, it would have to be something so dumb that, you know, people would be like, why did the 
you know, why did this team offer four first round picks to Patriots? But bare minimum, if you're like you don't like Jaden Daniels or JJ McCarthy, three. Bare minimum. I agree. And then especially with the Vikings, like they're probably going to make their trade before the draft actually happens with all these pro days and everything. They're probably going to want to narrow down what they're looking at. So I don't think that, you know, the first three is even going to be on the table on draft day. But if it is, I agree, like whatever team's coming to make an offer, you're going to have to really shell out, especially if you're on the clock, then the Patriots have all the leverage. All right. As a general manager, would you fill a four win team with drafting a top graded QB top four or take three to four upper grade players? That's a lot of numbers for me. I'm not a math guy. Late first and second round at positions of need. So I think this just comes down to, you know, the same type of conversation we've been having. Of would you rather, you know, get a guy who's going to be a bona fide elite talent like a Rome, like a Joe Walt? Or are you saying, again, I feel like this just comes down to how you feel about the quarterback. But if there's anything else you want to add to this, you know, we don't have to spend too much time on. I mean, at the end of the day, we don't know if the Patriots will ever be in this position to draft a quarterback with this high vote ceiling. And, and I'm talking about Jaden Daniels, too. If Jaden Daniels is the guy or J.J. McCarthy, you know, I know the stories about him right now are sort of all over the place. But I don't know if they'll be like, would you say Jacoby Brissett starts next year? You can convince me the Patriots will be better and win six games. But at six games, where are you? Right. Are you now what between five and seven? And if there's a quarterback who's going to go one or two, well, you're going to have to do to get up there. We know. Taylor, you're going to have to give them a bag. So, like, why give someone a bag next year when just take the guy this year? I, honestly, I'm all about the QB, man. If you hit on Drake Mayer, Jaden Daniels, you are set for the next 10 years, and then you can find pieces around them. You can find your, you know, your tackles and your receivers. And here's the thing. If Drake May isn't ready to play, you have a quarterback who is. And even if you're in the top 10 again next year, you can find a receiver next year. So, yeah, I'm all about the QB, man. Even with the elite wide receivers. Now it's become, I feel like, more clear that the quarterback does need at least one of those types of guys. But it's not really the other way around where a great quarterback isn't surviving. So if they're really good, they'll usually still make it work. But we've seen great wide receivers like Garrett Wilson just not really be able to do much because he doesn't have anybody throwing the ball with any consistency where he can maximize his potential. So, again, I agree. Take your quarterback. After the Gerard Mayo press conference, what are your thoughts on the Pats trading back with the Vikings and taking J.J. McCarthy or Bo Nix at 11? I think you have to take those guys. Again, different shades of the same thing, but more specifically to J.J. or Bo. How confident are you in those guys? I'll say if Drake May is a mystery box, like I think J.J. McCarthy is an even smaller one because there's less that you actually know. He's young, but Drake May is even younger than he is. So I, I don't know, man. Unless, again, you're getting a boatload of picks. I don't love the J.J. McCarthy signing. And then Bo, I think, is fine, but I don't think he's a good fit for a team that still, like we've already said, has a lot of holes they still need to fill. J.J. McCarthy, honestly, you'd probably have to trade to six because it sounds like teams in that four to six range are going to try to target him right now. I talked to a GM um, a month ago who told me he thought J.J. McCarthy might be from four to six and that teams might try to get him in front of the Giants. So, yeah, he might not be there at 11. And Bo Nix, the thing that scares me, is when I read a scouting report and I hear like point guard of the offense or, you know, more athletic game manager. I'm like, didn't we kind of just have that? Like, yeah. I don't, I don't want a point guard of the offense. The Bonix is 24, you know, he's a little older, you know, probably not the biggest arm in the draft. I just, I don't know. I want, I want high upside, man. I honestly want to swing for the fences. Give me, give me the home run. I'm on the same page, buddy. I like this. We're, uh, we're cooking right now. All right. We're going to take a quick break. We got to pay the bill. So quick word from our friends at prize picks. Be right back. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like Meek Mill and Sugar Sean O'Malley? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Prize Picks even offers injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't return in the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. With Jason Tatum going for the MVP, I'm taking more on his points and rebounds. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, we'll put some of the draft talk in the rear view. I feel like we've hit all the different permutations (laughs) that we possibly could. So... 
Going with some offensive line talk, are the Patriots preparing for a David Andrews-sized hole in the O-line next season? Should they be prioritizing center or interior offensive line on day three, or do you think they already have his replacement on the roster? I'm curious what you think about this. So, I mean, last year in the fourth round, they drafted Jake Andrews as center, and that's and that's who their backup center is, and that's who their potential David Andrews replacement is. I don't hate them adding another interior guy. And and what I've heard about this team is that right now there's uncertainty at left guard because they don't know when Cole Strange will be ready. He suffered a serious knee injury last year. And that's why they went out and signed Nick Leverett. That's why they also signed, it was I believe his name was Michael Jordan, to a yeah. futures contract. So they have two backup guards who have started at left guard. And the reason is because of Cole Strange. So by that metric, it, listen, it, you're sitting there rounds five, six, seven, and you want to draft a guy who can play guard and center, go for it. You can sometimes find gems. Like, for example, Ted Karras, a six-round pick back in the day, who's been a really good player in the NFL. So, yeah, I say right now the plan would be Jake Andrews if David Andrews leaves. Um, but I don't hate adding a late, you know, day three guy. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, and we already know they've been taking a look or talking to some center prospects. So there's C.J. Hansen. Uh, there was the Florida center as well. So I would like it to not be a center only type of prospect. Like I know Jake Andrews did show he could play some guard later in the year just because they were so desperate at the spot uh, in those last couple of weeks. But the sample size is so small. Like with Jake, even in training camp, we've mostly seen with like the third string guys. He really, it was mostly like uh, David Andrews and James Ferris. So we didn't get to see a lot of them. Um, and with this scheme taking the transition, likely going to be more zone oriented or wide zone oriented than a lot of the gap stuff we saw last year. It'll be interesting to see. All right. Do we want a guy who maybe isn't as strong, but is really more athletic? I'm not sure about that, but I definitely think that them taking an interior lineman on day three is on the table. And in my mock drafts, I've been incorporating them more. So do with that what you will. Just throwing this out there. Does Tyquan Thornton have the ability to leap in year three and beat our ex? Now, I'm the optimist here, and I know it. I'm completely acknowledging that this could be a take that like gets laughed at later on. But it is nice to at least see that he's bulking up because the biggest thing with him has been injuries. Like we saw with the, in the Packers joint practice where he catches the ball, falls down, and I think we were all just like, oh, this is not going to be good. He landed very hard. So I'd like to think that a little bit of body armor will help. Taekwon Underwood, I think, will go a long way in helping him fundamentally because I think that's been the biggest issue is the route running wasn't very good. Like, I even asked him last year, do you have freedom in your routes? Because I'm thinking, like, it's taken forever for him to look at the quarterback when the quarterback's looking at him. And he was like, yeah, I'm allowed to use my speed and kind of get creative. And I'm like, that does not sound like what should be happening for a guy who's played less than a 1,000 offensive snaps. So – what do you think? Do, are you excited about Taekwon Thornton, what we're seeing? Or are you just, yeah, no, show me in camp if there's anything there to sell. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a hard out. And, and I think it's great that he's bulking up because, as you said, the last two years he's he started the season on the IR. Two years in a row, it, that's horrible for any receiver's development. What which makes me hesitant about Taekwon Thornton, it's great he's adding muscle, but is he learning to run routes like you said? Can he come off the line of scrimmage? Because whatever he was doing when the ball was snapped off the line of scrimmage just looked really ugly. It just You know, it, it doesn't seem he's really polished as a receiver. Um, I asked someone in the building about him a month ago who just said, other than straight line speed, we don't know if we have anything. And, and that's why I like, for me, other than gadget plays, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put any stock into Tyquan Thornton until he actually does it because last year he finished with less than a hundred yards for the season. That's hard. I feel like that's hard to do when you're a receiver. So it's great that he's bulking up, but he really needs to hit his routes hard before he can show that, He's anything other than that straight line jet sweep type guy. So I'm not, I'm not banking on it. I agree. And I, I will make it clear. I'm not saying anything's going to happen, but I'm at least excited at the prospect of one of the young guys breaking out, pulling for him, but you put it perfectly. You got to see what happens on the field. Sticking with receivers. What do you think happens with booty? He's the seventh on the depth chart. In my opinion, maybe practice squad. I thought it was interesting that Gerard Mayo you know, he obviously he's still on the team, but I thought he would be a little more of the vein of like, yeah, we're seeing what happens because I don't even see how he's on the roster kind of going into training camp, much less cut down day. I know like legally and everything, they still have to figure things out. But I mean, is he going to be able to do anything? I, I really I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe the practice squad. I think that's a good way to put it. I mean, I think he'll get cut at some point. Maybe the practice squad. He just. I don't know. I feel like something was going on last year behind the scenes. He just sort of disappeared and he didn't have a bad training camp. Honestly, his training camp made me think like, all right, he's a guy who can go out and catch three balls for 45 yards in an NFL game right now. And it didn't happen. And the Patriots needed someone like that to help them, especially when like Kendrick Bourne went down and like Tyquan Thornton was hurt. Like where, where was Kayshawn Booty? It just, and add the gambling stuff to it. I just, I don't know. I, I'm not going to bank on him. You know, I, there's, 
fine. Keep him on the roster. See what happens in that court case or whatever is going on. But I think the Patriots are going to draft a receiver. Maybe they'll draft two this year. And, you know, how they handle that position in the draft will probably tell us what they think about Kayshawn Blue. And I will say, I think Kayshawn was put in a bad spot. Like, he's playing X. I don't think anybody who watched him was thinking that was the best position for him to be in. We saw in the first week of the season, obviously still a rookie, like, not really holding that against him. But we saw the boundary awareness is one of those things for young guys where it's like, no, he should be used over the middle of the field. Where Like, we saw he probably made the roster a lot because of that slant route he ran late in the preseason where he goes and takes it for a touchdown. It's like, all right, that's what we thought we were going to see. Not all the sideline stuff and having him be like a legitimate X, which I thought was strange. But, yeah, with especially the off-field stuff. And then, yeah, on top of it, all right, we can't even produce on the field. Uh, my hopes there are not high, to put it lightly. Who's your personal pick for a player to break out this season for the Patriots? More of a fun question here. That's a really fun question. Um, this You could argue this player broke out last year. My prediction for the Patriots is that Christian Barmore will be the best player on the team next year. That's like, like he broke out. You can say he had the best season of his career, but I think Christian Barmore goes to all pro, pro bowl potential. He's so good. Thing with him, honestly, is he has to stay healthy. He's had a knee issue the last couple of years, but he's in a position to get paid a lot of money next off season. As Gerard Mayo said, they are working with him right now on a contract extension. But honestly, I think he's going to take it up a notch, man. Get that first Pro Bowl honor. Get maybe, you know, all pro conversations. But a game record as a defensive tackle, man. Christian Barmore is my guy. I like that. I'm going to stick on the defensive side of the ball. Christian Gonzalez. Good I mean, one. obviously, it's one month. He's still one defensive rookie of the month. And it's not even like he was just playing, you know, a backside role where he's not really covering. Like, no, they were putting him in positions where they were like, all right, if the best receiver is isolated – we want Christian there, which tells you all you need to know. This is a guy who got thrown into the fire against A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith and was making key plays in the fourth quarter. Then you see oh, they had Marcus Jones on Tyreek Hill. They had to switch that during the game. He goes from uh, following Waddle to following Tyreek, gets that crazy interception when they're playing zone. Like I think you saw all the flashes and a lot of the critiques that he had going into the season were all his toughness and his tackling and all that. I think he heard it because he was plenty tough. He wasn't really out there uh, missing tackles. He was a force in the run game. He was flying up to be involved, and he wasn't letting anybody get behind him. Right. That's on top of the ball skills and the natural athleticism and the fact that he looked as calm as a guy who'd already been in the league for several years. So yeah. Armour, I do agree, is probably going to be just by nature of the position. Like if you're a great interior lineman, it's impossible to avoid you because you're right in the heart of the defense. Even if they move you around, it's tough to stop those guys. And at cornerback, it's harder to make as much of an impact because they can completely ignore you. But that in itself is a pretty impactful role. So I like Christian Barmore. I would have used it if you hadn't taken it. But Gonzalez is my top pick. All right. Kind of getting back to the quarterback situation. With that set to play out his contract in Dallas, would you consider loading up on weapons or stealing it from and then stealing it from the Cowboys with a huge deal? Now, this is one that I don't like banking on what's going to happen with quarterbacks in the future. But if there is an argument, considering this situation does look like the Cowboys are just going to completely bungle it, I find it interesting. At the very least, I find it interesting. I mean, I'll say this. This would take an unbelievable amount of tampering, right? Because if you were to bypass a quarterback because you think a guy might be available in a year, you really have to know because the worst thing that could happen is he's not available in a year. Like, we can't bank on Dak Prescott until we actually know he'll be a free agent. So. <laughs> At that point, I would say do not do that unless you're literally talking to him and his agent right now and you're doing something sketchy behind the scenes. And I'm not saying they should do that. I, I think they should draft a quarterback, as I've already stated. But it's really hard to plan for something that might happen next year, but it also might not. It's like, you know, Gerard was even like Robert was saying this past week at the owners meetings. Well, players could become available after the draft or guys we might be able to sign people if they get released. Yeah, but it's just also hard to build your team that way when you don't know who actually will get released or you don't know who will be a free agent. Like, hypothetically, you could say the same thing about the receiver class next year. C.D. Lamb, Brandon Ayuk, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins. If all those guys are available, yeah, man, don't draft someone and sign those guys. But, like, what are the odds that C.D. Lamb and Jamar Chase and Brandon Ayuk are free agents? So it's hard to plan for that a year from now. Yeah, that's totally fair. Those guys, as we saw this offseason, those guys – don't really hit the market unless the team is just trying to get picks. And even then, that's, you know, it's not them actually hitting the market. It's just franchise tagging them so that you don't lose out on potential compensation. But, yeah, I 
I, I think that it's it's fair to say, okay, if they do load up in the future, like Trevor Lawrence is somebody who might be an option down the road or something like that. But I agree, man. You're banking on something that may or may not happen. And who knows if you're even in a spot where somebody wants to come and sign with you, regardless of how many weapons you hit on. So, yeah, that's a much riskier strategy. There's not much room for defensive rookies to find playing time outside of starting corner. Should New England even bo- even bother drafting developmental defensive guys this year or just restock in 2025? So I was thinking about this question earlier today, and I think there are a couple spots that I could see it working out. One's free safety. I know they signed with Jalen Hawkins, but there's a spot for like a day three free safety to come in here and actually play because think about it. um, You know, they lost Jalen Mills and Adrian Phillips. They brought in Jalen Hawkins. Um, Kyle Duggar might play on the transition tag. I mean, there's room for safety to come in here and play eventually, even if, you know, someone's to come in and give Hawkins you know, some competition. So I think free, free safety is the spot they could draft. Another one, it would be cornerback. Um, they lost Miles Bryant. They do have Marcus Jones, but he's coming off a season-ending injury. Jonathan Jones is one to sort of watch for just because he was hurt basically all last year. And he's getting up there. And when you have a cornerback, he starts, you know, gets close to 30, you have to plan. So, yeah. I, and I think cornerback is another spot. I, I could see them drafting a guy in like the fourth round. That wouldn't shock me. if Maybe even the third, third or fourth round. If they drafted a cornerback, that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, I think if they really hit on those first three picks, if it's like, all right, we got a quarterback, a left, maybe there's not really a lot of left tackles, I think, outside of the first round that are going to start for you very quickly. But at least you're saying, all right, we got a really good developmental left tackle, a receiver who can immediately contribute. Now, okay, the other holes aren't as glaring, especially with tight end. Like a lot of that depth is more in the mid to late rounds. I like a lot of these mid-round cornerbacks, like um, Chris Abrams Drain, somebody that they, I believe, met with recently. He's got a lot of Jack Jones in him with that wide receiver background, kind of undersized, really good athleticism. Uh, Josh Newton, guy to TCU, Max Melton out of Rutgers. There's a lot of really interesting names. And I agree, especially with Miles Bryant no longer being on the team. Cornerback, I don't think it's really set yet. It would be great if Alex Austin could continue to develop and become you know, a guy they end up relying on. But even in the slot, you're relying on a lot of guys with either significant injury histories or who are coming off in your reserve. It's only like Marco Wilson and Alex right. Austin are the only guys that were really healthy. So, yeah, I agree. I don't think that starting cornerback is set by any means. And I think the secondary could use some help in terms of like long term starting ta- caliber talent. All right. Last one. Which draft eligible non quarterback receiver or offensive tackle do you see as a good fit? I love this question. Um, and I'm going to steal a guy that you really like. His name is Tip Raymond, a tight end from Illinois. I love him. So this is a guy, I don't know where he's going to be drafted, right? Fifth, sixth, seventh round pick. I do this thing where I take past combine averages from every prospect the Patriots have drafted over the last like 24 years. Tip Raymond is my top athletic fit at tight end. He hits every mark other than the vertical, and he misses the vertical by half inch. Like this guy has the size, the athleticism. He's a former walk-on turn captain. I'm sold. Yeah. Draft him. I don't six rounds, fifth round. Go for it, man. Tip Raymond's my guy. Also, I went to the University of New Hampshire. So Dylan Lobby, running back slash re- receiving prospect. Also, that's my guy too. So those two guys right there. I'll be rooting for the Patriots to take one of them. Would you say that we still have a they still have a good shot at getting Lobby now that they have Antonio Gibson? Because for me, like my Lobby dreams were kind of shot after that. But at the same time, I mean, similar skill sets, but both dynamic players. Yeah, I agree. I I mean, I I could see the Patriots drafting a running back, but it'll probably be more of a, you know, hard nose, north south runner now. But Lobby, you're right. Lobby's my my dream too. But Antonio Gibson is a good receiver. I'm going to go through my mock drafts and see if there's anyone who really jumps out. Ooh, Bub me. Oh, wait, no, he's already a receiver. Damn, I was trying to go with somebody who's kind of under the radar. He's on on my list too. And I saw uh, Tyquan Underwood was there. Obviously, he coached him, but he was there at Pitt to watch him work out. But Bub me is another one. I'm with you. I like him. Athletic guy, day three receiver. Yeah, bring him board. And his name is Bob. Okay, so I would go with Isaac Garendo. He is really exciting to me. Now, I think the backfield, they're pretty well set right now. Reminder Stevenson is kind of the thunder, and then you get a little bit more of the lightning kind of aspect. Although Antonio Gibson's really big as well. But Garendo, man, one, I think this is going to be a team that wants to run the ball a lot, both by the fact that they kind of have to, if they're going to have a young quarterback, even if it is Jacoby Brissett. And the fact that just what we've seen from Alex Van Pelt, like he loves play action. He loves especially the run schemes where it looks like you're trying to run like a gap scheme or something with somebody pulling, and then you go out and throw it over their head. So I think a guy like Garendo, one, he's explosive. And that's something this team really needs. I think that he gives you a lot of big playability. 
And as a rotation in that backfield, I think that'd be a really good three-headed monster back there. He's a guy where I really want to do more tape study, but everything I've seen from him, I'm like, yeah, no, this is a guy who yeah, can really yeah. add some juice at a position that we're not really talking about a ton. So in, in terms of my like Patriot athletic fits, the thing I do, he's actually my number one. Um, he hits the most marks out of every running back at the combine in terms of what the Pats have looked for in the past, those right. like athletic taste testing. Yeah. Well, looks like we're on the same page yet again, my friend. Yeah. This was a fantastic time. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Now, please let the people know where they can find you and what excellent stuff we can look forward to coming down the pipeline. Thanks, guys. You can find myself at uh, MassLive.com and on Twitter at ByMarkDaniels. But thanks, man. Thanks. This was fun. This was. We'll do it again. Thank you so much. And thank you all, as always, for watching. Now, take care of yourself.